show and maybe talk to Olga for a little bit. But if not, you're very welcome to do it after the talk. And thank you, so it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you to Brad. And some of you have already been very much acquainted with what we do, and for others it's, it's very new, so I hope you really like it. And I must say that it is a great honor to be introducing to you Sir Anthony Dauphin, a fantastic scholar, successful art dealer, great collector, amazing mentor, it looks like people who went through his gallery you know, are just are having all the major art institutions at the moment. Great philanthropist and a supporter of Brad in conversation with Francis Morris, brilliant director of international collections at Tate. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you, Brad, very much for hosting us. It's a really generous generous moment and occasion, and I'm just thrilled that Olga Chernesheva, whose exhibition is on display, is also with us, and looking forward to seeing the show more properly afterwards. Thank you. I see some of you are clutching this wonderful rainbow-coloured uh, publication, which is the uh, book published on, on the occasion of the first five years of Artists' Rooms, and I just wanted to uh, thank Kira for supporting the uh, offering of these volumes to all of you. And Anthony's very kindly signed them, and Kira's donation will go towards supporting learning programs for artist rooms, and uh, we need all the support we can get, so thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, of course, Anthony hardly needs an introduction, but I just want to put a bit of flesh on the bones of the story. Anthony uh, uh, established a gallery in London in 1980, and that gal gallery for 20 years was without question the preeminent space for modern and contemporary art in not just London, not just in the UK, but really in Europe. And I think what's interesting is when you look at the exhibition programs of Tate, of Serpentine, of Haywood Gallery, of the National Galleries of Scotland, of many of the museums in this country and abroad, those artists, the, mid, you know, the, the, the great sort of um, figures of our time, were artists that Anthony first introduced to audiences, uh, to collectors and to institutions over that 20 year period. Um, as if that wasn't enough and as if uh, it wasn't about the right time to retire and rest on his laurels <laughs> after 20 years, uh, when ga the gallery closed in 2001, Anthony had uh, a second life in mind. And it's interesting, I think, because he traded the life of a dealer to, for the life of a collector. And that's a really interesting and quite unusual transition to make. And he pursued the, uh, uh, the role of collector with just as much ambition, uh, tenacity, dare I say it, Flair, patience, impatience, um, as he uh, had How dare you. <laughs> uh, his role as a dealer, and uh, put together uh, not only a remarkable collection, but I think a collection that had, had a very specific characteristic. And although I think you, dare I say, collected from the heart, you also collected with enormous sense of strategy, because what uh, Anthony was doing was not putting together a collection for his own. Uh, delectation, amusement, uh, interest, nor for his family, but a collection uh, to give to the nation. And over the period of five or six years, you built a collection uh, focusing on around 25 artists, but comprising around a thousand works, and a collection that truly built sort of museum scale representations of some of the great artists that you'd worked with over those 20 years. And uh, Anthony came to Tate in, uh, after you'd been collecting for about four or five years, I think 2005, 2006, yes. with this vision to work with Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland to put together a collection that would join the national collections, but be distinctive, and that would be a collection that we would host and share with all the public galleries and museums in the UK. And I think this is extraordinary, completely unprecedented. Nobody has ever come to us and said, I'd like to give you a work of art, but I want you to share it with the Orkneys. <laughs> or I want these photographs to go to St. Ives, or uh, Leeds, or Walsall. 
But that was the proposition. And uh, it took a few weeks, months, slash years to get our head around it. But we had a wonderfully intense period of about two years when Nick and Anthony, and then myself and other curators, really worked together to kind of finalize and, and shape this vision. Um, and the collection came to Tate uh, jointly with the National Galleries of Scotland. It's a shared collection called Artists' Rooms in 2008. And since that time, guided by Anthony, in fact, interestingly, I've always looked at, uh, up to Anthony as uh, you know, real, a role model and mentor in the visual arts, but in 2008 he became a curator working for me. Because <laughs> part of the agreement was that Anthony is now an ex officio curator at Tate, and so we have curatorial meetings every few months, and uh, we seek his advice. And, that uh, means that I have to be very, very, very well behaved <laughs> part of the time. Actually, I have to be incredibly well behaved <laughs> most of the time, but it is, it, I'm awed, and I do well behave, because this is the biggest gift of art to any public institution in the UK ever. Biggest in number, but also in value. I think uh, when we acquired it in 2008, it was valued around 120 million. And so, you know, prices have probably moved on a little bit since then. So that just gives you some sense of the uh, value. Of course, the value to the nation is far in excess of its financial value, because over the course of five, six, almost seven years now, I think we've had over 150 exhibitions of works from artist rooms at well over 70 venues. And so works in the collection have probably been seen by about 35 slash 40 million people, many of whom are under 35, many of whom are under 20, many of whom are under 16. And I think you have achieved your ambition, which was A, to create this wonderful collection, B, to make the collection available to the nation, and C, above all, to make it available to young people. And to make it free, so that everything is free always. All the exhibitions are free and all the educational projects are free, and with an emphasis on education and young people. Because I think that um, the, the guiding principle for us was to try to make rooms, you know, collectors, tend to have something very beautiful over the fireplace, something beautiful over the dining room, over the sofa, etc. We try to do something completely different. We try to put together a room, should we say, of Andy Warhol, that works as a room, which tells the story of Andy Warhol. So we were always trying to make something which was when it had been tailored for that particular exhibition, working with the curators at Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland, told the story very accurately so that you could actually know who Richard Long was or Robert Maplethorpe was. It told you the story of that artist. And um, so that it didn't feel like a collector's group of things, it felt like a room which had either come, you know, from the artist's estate or from the artist himself, but which told the story as far as possible. With Andy Warhol, for example, there are a hundred paintings and drawings, and if you want to look at Andy Warhol drawings, you can see 50, 60 great drawings. If you want to look at the great late paintings, there are some marvellous things there. And you can look at late Warhol. And there are 125 posters, for example. And there are great, great prints and other things. So it's in depth. It tells the story. You know, if you want to pass your exams, go and look at uh, what's there. Is it worth pointing out, Anthony, that one of the things that regional galleries and museums in the UK find very difficult is you know, undertaking research and uh, uh, borrowing great work from museums. And so what the Artist Rooms collection has effectively done is, is sort of provided mini exhibition scale right. representations of some of the really great artists of the 20th century. And so for many of the receiving 
institutions. This is the first time ever that they've had great work by Warhol or Joseph Boyce or Agnes Martin in their gallery. And the, you know, the benefit or the impact on those regional museums and their staff and their audience is huge. Absolutely. I was born in um, Sheffield, which is the equivalent of Pittsburgh. I'm sure maybe in Russia there are some steel cities. <laughs> Wh which one? You can't be in Okay. But, you know, those cities, like Pittsburgh, where Andy Warhol was brought up, aren't great places for culture, normally. They're great places for steel and immigrants and the light, the light of the furnaces at night and all those things. What we were trying to do was to say outside London and outside Edinburgh there are wonderful people who are longing for culture to have culture in their lives. And I'm not talking about art education. I'm talking about the effect that great works of art have on you when you look at them and scratch your head and say there's something truly wonderful there but I don't quite understand it. You know, I really want to think about it. I really want to read a little bit about it. I really want to come back again. And you can because the shows are free. The museums are free. And by doing this sort of uh, gymnastics with your mind, if you see what I mean, when you're 8 to 12 or a teenager or a student, are very important because out of that, I believe, comes the creativity that we want from young people in this country. On that note, should we look at the three short films <laughs> that you brought? <laughs> Yes, so there are three films. The first film is about a Bruce Nauman show in Preston. And um, it's the curator, very nice bright girl, talking rather proudly about the exhibition there. This is the Harris Museum and Art Gallery in Preston. We have lots of Victorian paintings and fine art. We also put on contemporary exhibitions, and right now we're showing the works of Californian artist Bruce Nauman. Since the 1960s, he's been one of the most influential figures in contemporary art. Early in his career, he abandoned painting in favor of performance, installation, video, and neon. Bruce Nauman was instrumental in shaking up the definition of art, how it could be produced, how it could be presented, and how it could be experienced by you and me in the gallery. This piece is called Violins, Violence, Silence. I love it because it uses Nauman's trademark medium of neon. It's like advertising gone mad. It's really poppy. It's constantly changing. This was inspired by a dream that Nauman had about being trapped in an enclosed space. This corridor is just wide enough for two people to walk past each other. The harshly lit light bulbs switch on and off, at times in sync, and at other times leaving you in complete darkness. For me, the power of this work comes from the excitement and suspense, the lure and the trepidation of experiencing it firsthand. It feels like a no man's land, a limbo space. As gallery visitors, we're not passive, but actively involved. It provokes a reaction, and that's what I like about it. This is Violent Incident. It starts off as a joke. The man presents the chair for the woman to sit down, and as she's about to sit, he pulls it from beneath her, and it quickly evolves into an argument. The tone of this work becomes more and more sinister as the couple get locked in a cycle of destructive behaviour. Samuel Beckett influenced Nauman, and I think we can see that in this work. We're all alone, we can't communicate, life is inexplicable, but also kind of funny. Bruce Nauman was one of the first artists to use a video camera at the time when they were becoming more affordable. In this work, Bruce Nauman is building himself a fence on his ranch in New Mexico. What I like about this work is that he moves in and out of the picture, and so whether you see him or not, it's potluck. It's a great example of the way in which Nauman sets himself parameters for producing a video, 
and in doing so, deliberately rejects the idea of making any other aesthetic decisions, leaving it to chance or the gallery visitor. What I love about Bruce Nauman's work is that he pushes and explores every boundary that he can. And the resulting works that we see here in the exhibition are funny, sinister, odd and baffling, shaking things up and making us think. Fantastic. And th this was a, um, a film of uh, students in Edinburgh inspired by Louise Bourgeois exhibition, which we put together. And um, the Tate had a great Louise Bourgeois show. What was the name of the distinguished curator? <laughs> <laughs> which changed my life. The show was so good. It changed my life. And uh, inspired by that show, we tried with the estate to put together a collection, which now, according to Jerry Gorovoy, with the Tate's collection, the Artist Shrimp's collection, makes it the best museum collection uh, in the world. And we had a beautiful opening in Scotland at the National Gallery. And um, this, this is actually about some of the results with the young people and students from that experience. When we knew we were having this exhibition, we realised it would have a lot of potential for good artistic collaboration. And I think because of the themes that run throughout this exhibition are quite strong, it really did lend itself to that kind of performative element. We really wanted it to be that collaboration between the art student and the dancer. We set the students to research Louise Bourgeois. Not many of them had actually heard of Louise Bourgeois, so that was a great plus from this exercise. It became clear that the students had a very personal engagement with Louise Bourgeois, and they were using that personal response as the key to designing their work. My idea was based on Louise's anxiety. I, I actually suffer from anxiety myself, so I took inspiration from her. She was more interested on the internal workings of the body rather than its form. So I looked at veins and capillaries, arteries and cells, and then translated them to a costume. Well, I looked at all her work and I found my main inspiration actually from her words. So I looked at all her, uh, what she actually said about her work. I looked at her childhood and the sense of escaping away from it. So that was my main kind of base of it. So my costume is therefore this kind of like essentially runaway child. Choreographically, the dancers themselves have done quite a lot of improvisation. They've also done a unit called Dance for Alternative Spaces. So they're quite comfortable with performing outside of the black box, is what we call it, but none of them have performed in this type of gallery space before. It's quite strange because people are so close to you, usually with performing we're on a stage and the audience is separate. Also with having no music and no concept of time, what you're doing and how long you do it for depends on who's in the room, so it's a very new experience. It was important for me to get the design students moving through the space, just so as they had an understanding of what the possibilities might be when they started to design and make the work, and whether or not they were going to want to move towards something that was much more restricted, or something that the dancer could really explore the space. It's like we become like characters with these costumes. Normally we're just dancing to create movement, but this is the costume helping us create the movement. Yeah, it's really lovely to see because obviously it's been very static um, beforehand and it's really nice just to have that kind of um, combining between both costume and dancing and I mean how Eleanor's worked is just fantastic. Like, I'm really happy <laughs> how it's come together. 
We always knew we wanted to have some kind of sharing experience of the event, so we found which works would lend themselves well to doing that kind of public event. And actually just coming into a gallery and sort of seeing that happening is quite a nice experience. I think it makes people look at art in a different way. So it kind of adds to the whole idea of what a gallery is and what it's for. is about uh, Baltic, up in the north of England, putting on an Anselm Kiefer exhibition of works in artist rooms and works also from Tate's uh, permanent collection. And um, this is a little film made by some really young, sparky kids. <laughs> and it's impossible not to fall in love with them, as you'll see. We are at the Baltic and Gate set to see the Anselm Kiefer show. On floor three, there are six huge paintings. Everything else just looks like slops of paint to me, but this one looks really good. I had a look at all of them and read a bit about them to get more information. And to be, I like this one most of all. I was drawn to this one straight away. It just stood out for me. I just liked it. When you favour back, you can see it more clearly. Is it the kind of painting you'd have in your house? Well, maybe not in the hallway or just next to the front door, but I would have it in my room. It's a bit too scary. Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't like to walk in and see that in my living room. If I went in, I would think my mum's gone mental or something. I think this painting's like for galleries, not really for your house. On level four, there, there's a big installation called Palm Sunday, and there are some of our paintings. I've never really seen anything like this. I didn't really expect anything, but I didn't really expect this. I think I need to look at it a bit longer. They might tell a story by the way they look in the materials used and the colours behind. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's massive. Uh, I like big things. T tiny ruins it with the massive ones, you see more detail. It looks like a big castle, like the tunnel of a castle. It's all right. It's a bit scary. Do you think the artists should explain what their work is about or not? No, because it'd be a bit more interesting to find out about it yourself. And plus you could give your own opinions on what you think it was about. I don't really get what this one's meant to represent or anything. I don't really like paintings that you have to have someone tell you what it's about. For it, like, then you'll know. I know then you'll know what it's about. But then, if you don't understand what it is yourself, then I don't think the artist has done what he's meant to do. Top tip for visiting Baltic would be to um, just make sure you can look look at every painting and get get your own view about it. Don't get lost. Look at everything and look at it close and far away because you're gonna see something different. Avoid the lifts. The Anselm Kiefer exhibition is on from the 8th of October 2010 until 16th of January 2011. <laughs> <laughs> the wisdom of youth. <laughs> So think... that's, sorry, that's just a real small sample of the very many uh, films and Absolutely. documentary snapshots of this programme, which are utterly charming. I think one thing that's immediately interesting is that you see the museum in Preston. It's a Victorian building with a Victorian collection. 
probably, don't you think, it had quite a lot of money, maybe... Once upon a time. Once upon a time. <laughs> maybe, you know, a hundred years ago, and was able to buy some important pictures of the Royal Academy, etc. If you go to a museum like that today, they don't really have the funds to make acquisitions themselves. If you ask them what their acquisition funds are, they'll probably say something like, we've got seven or eight thousand pounds. If we try very, very hard, we can push that to 15, 18,000. We did buy a picture that cost 100,000, you know, 12 years ago. So they don't ha they can't buy works of art like this. And normally speaking, to have an exhibition like that, a loan exhibition, you'd have to borrow it from all sorts of places, which would make it impossibly expensive. Actually, we've got a map of the UK up with uh, the current or the 2015 locations, and they're really spread around, you know, top to bottom, east to west. Can you say something about how we select the venues? How do we choose where artists' rooms go any, at any one time? I think that we get a lot of requests. Claire, how often? Uh, like once a year, we get 60, 70 requests yeah. Yeah. from museums around the country saying, you know, we very much want to take an artist rooms. These are the artists in the order which we would most like to have show. Please, can you help us? And then I think we look at the map and we look at our purse and we try to think you know, is this a part of the country where there hasn't been an important show? And so we try to make a lot of judgments for the best show that they can have there in that place at that time. And then we work with them on that concept. And on that basis, Anthony, if yes. we're being strategic, yes. you know, if I was a, a museum, I'd want to be there next year, or there, you're sure that I got an artist's room. But there is that sense of sort of um, fairness and geographical spread, isn't there? Absolutely. But I think that we're also looking for institutions where there seems to be a real appetite to not just host the room, but really do something with it. And I think that's um, so when people apply for, for their artist's rooms, they say what they're going to do with it, who it's for. Um, how they're going to work with a collection, what audiences might benefit. Yes, and we do little publications which are for teachers who are going to take school parties and youth groups there. So that part becomes absolutely integral to the programme. And as I say, it isn't really about teaching them about art history, it's about teaching them actually to think in a creative way. When Anthony and I went up last year to Middlesbrough, which is sort of in the middle of England, uh, Middlesbrough were hosting... Captain Cook came from Middlesbrough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, you wouldn't know it. <laughs> it's a kind of post-industrial blighted city. Um, most of its uh, Victorian architecture has disappeared, but it has a very beautiful uh, modern contemporary arts centre, no permanent collection. But they had asked to have Louise Bourgeois, and they had installed it very beautifully in rather special and nicely designed galleries. And uh, Anthony and I and Jerry Gorovoy went up and met, met, met their group of sort of young people, young people who are interested in art and sort of have a club-like relationship. And in uh, Middlesbrough at Mima, they're called the Wonder Wise. That's, a nice, that's really. a nice name for these 14, 16-year-olds the wonder wise and of course that is because their job is to wonder why okay and it's from the wondering why that they actually learn something important but what was interesting is they've done really fascinating projects with the art itself and we saw some of the video documentation and it was completely thrilling to meet them and they were very moved i think by working 
with the bourgeois work. But later that evening, we were also giving a talk at the university. So a, a sort of quite formal, you know, 400 people, tiered seating, uh, lo, lo, low lights, rather intimidating, and Anthony and me and Jerry Gorovoy on the table. And I said to the Wonderwires as we were going in, I said, please do ask questions, you know, after the talk. And so we did this talk, and then there was that any questions moment. And now, almost always in those situations, nobody asks any questions. It's very embarrassing, and, you know, somebody wraps it up. And so there was long silence, and then I just looked at one of the wonder whys. And there was a little pause, and then suddenly a hand went up. And then the discussion was animated entirely by those 14-year-olds. It was quite extraordinary, and I think we realised then that this kind of engagement with young people, it's not just about art. It's about taking control of their lives, it's about developing their imaginations, it's, it really helps them articulate their and position. And it's about their courage yeah. and their creativity. Yeah. And so it, has a, it just, for me, was a very visible demonstration of the power of art and engagement with art. And so I think Artist Rooms has, it has you know, sends shockwaves far beyond the, the, the world of art itself. When I was... Um when I was young, in the 1940s and 1950s, there was something called the Circulation Department, which were small exhibitions sent round by the Victoria and Albert Museum in some moment of crisis. Uh, distinguished director, what was he called? With a, what was he called? Any offers? Roy Strong. Roy so Strong. Roy Strong. Roy Strong cancelled it. And for me, a schoolboy in Leicester, that was like a bullet in my chest. That I could no longer go to see a show of Paul Nash with one painting, four watercolours, six prints, and a big text and a photograph of the artist. And I felt <coughs> previously that these things had come to Leicester for me to see. And it was a shock. And then the next, three months later, it would be, you know, five pieces of Indian sculpture. It had gone. And then there was a sort of silence. And nothing filled that silence. And so the idea of trying to make shows for young people across the country seemed to me absolutely crucial. I'm sure everybody in this know, room knows the cost of the railways and curses the various companies who overcharge us to go to Edinburgh and Glasgow and Birmingham and uh, uh, Manchester even. If you're a young person or a student, you can't afford it. You've got to go through a, with a bus in the middle of the night. It's so expensive. So the idea that you can come to London and see all the shows, you can't do it. So what do you see? Books, films, videos? That's not really the way to experience art. The way to experience art is the way, like meeting people. Works of art, in some real sense, are alive. And you should approach them with good manners. And listen to them and be quiet with them. When my mum, from the age of seven onwards or so, parked me, and be good dear, uh, at the local museum and said to the nice man behind the desk, and I'll come back in two and a half hours and make sure that he doesn't get up to any trouble. <laughs> that experience of being alone with works of art was so strong for me, knowing nothing about the history of art, but slowly making friends with some of the pictures. And, you know, trying being in a room quietly. Seven-year-old boys aren't in a room quietly on their own, let alone with beautiful works of art. And I remember, as a teenager, the Contemporary Art Society gave a painting by, by Francis Bacon to the museum. And this painting, which was sort of life-size, was 
a sort of complete shock to me. The drawing is wrong. The colours are wrong. <laughs> Why does it make my heart beat? What is it? I don't even know quite what it is. Is that a man? Is that a woman? Why are the colours so strange? What does it mean? And I think that from that inquiry grows a way of, a sort of new way of seeing the world and judging things. And that's why I think contemporary art is of such great importance. So you were a wonder why. I was a wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we wonder why? Let's look at some of the artists that yeah, are in our You get some slides, actually. Tell us why these artists. Mm. Right hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. okay. Great. Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I worked with Andy Warhol in 1986, and he did one of his last paintings with us. This was an artist who was so peculiar, so unlike anybody in the whole of the world you had ever met, or so amazingly different from anybody you could ever imagine that quite often you were speechless. And when I said to him, Andy, we'd love to do a show of your work in, in London, he said, yeah, great, Anthony. What would you like to show? Whatever you like. He said, what do you mean? Whatever? I'll, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Okay. Nobody in the history of art at any time since the founding of human beings said such a thing, <laughs> ever, or will ever say such a thing again, okay? He meant it, and he would do it. So I felt an enormous responsibility actually to try to think of an image which would be great, iconic, unforgettable. And we worked um, actually on a, the last self-portrait. And this, one of the most beautiful of them is uh, in the Tate Gallery. These are all late paintings. The skulls. Remember this man was shot and killed in 1968 and then brought back to life in the hospital after a three-hour op operation. Skulls is a good subject for such a person, such a survivor. The dollar sign, how many days are that we don't think about the value of the dollar and the position of America? Those actually are the guns with which he was shot. That is to say, they are the guns exactly like the one that he was shot with. And this is a four-part painting of camouflage um, on the left, which, as you know, is either what your cute girlfriend wears in the way of trousers, or something that's going on in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world. And those cute cows from the 60s as wallpaper. Would you like to say something about this? Well, I remember putting this up <laughs> <laughs> in, in, a, in a high gallery in 1999, just before Tate Modern opened. And in, interestingly, this is the, it's a great work by Joseph Boyce, and it's the one installation that has been continuously on display at Tate Modern since 2000. And it's a still point in a turning world for us. It's uh, Boyce is so hugely important in the history of uh, late 20th century art, both as a sculptor, but as a teacher, as a politician, as a great um, experimenter, uh, challenging and uh, entertaining in turns. And uh, this is a really major work, um, I think an outstanding work from his career. We also have in the artist room's collection um, 110 drawings and um, also uh, 
I expect you remember that his most famous work of all is called Fat Chair and is in the Hessische Landesmuseum uh, in Darmstadt. We also have, I think, a slightly earlier proto-fat chair in the artist room's collection. Um, he was the first artist that we showed in 1980, and it was a, an incredible privilege to know this person, who had been killed during the war and came back again as well. It's amazing, these artists, huh? <laughs> How they come back to complete their work. <laughs> and uh, one of the founders of the Green Party, somebody deeply concerned all his life with education and young people and creativity. Jeder Mensch ein Künstler, every man an artist, what he means is that it, we have, as human beings, to be creative to heal the world. Say something about uh, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting when you when you um, when you spoke about Warhol, you used Jeff Koons's voice. <laughs> <laughs> You're <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You tell us all about Koons. Um, we were very involved with Jeff Koons um, for a number of years. We put Puppy outside the museum in Bilbao and we worked with him on a lot of projects. Um, as a result of that, I think we have 16 or 17 works in artist rooms, which might just be the largest collection of his work in a public museum. And uh, so we're very proud of those things. And here in Norwich. Norwich Castle Museum, thank you so much, dear, um, we had a beautiful show and we had a lovely youth group called the Coombs Collective who I think got on to a, what's it called? A float and won a prize in the Lord Mayor's Parade. Um, what, were they dressed up as Coombs Cops? I think they were just dressed up in a cute way, <laughs> to tell you the truth. <laughs> At any rate, um, there were beautiful works of his. Um, and here are some iconic pieces, including, as you can see, uh, what is called the Winter Bears, which is a famous banality work. And uh, I suggest might well be Mr. and Mrs. Coons taking young Geoffrey to kindergarten at a very early age. Um, you can also see, can't you, that that looking at the works, you immediately ask yourself questions. Why basketballs? You know, why hoovers? All those, why those mirrors, etc. So it's a really important way of starting to think. Oh, here is uh, um, uh, Palm Sunday, which we saw earlier on in the... I might just say that um, we have been the beneficiaries, haven't we, of extraordinary generosity. This work came to us pretty much as a gift, and um, we have had millions and millions and millions of dollars of gifts from artists. I think there are two sorts of artists. The ones who care about the rich and famous, and the ones who care about the people in Oxford Street. And the ones who care about the people in Oxford Street, they have been the incredibly generous ones. And they feel that it's important that their work should be seen by young people. And, you know, that it's important to them that the shows are free and that... Um, their work is available to the world. Who can tell us who that is? Yes. 
It's Robert Maplethorpe, absolutely. And... Says the photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a, a, a cracking collection. Um, I think over a hundred uh, photographs. Most of them vintage. Um, he was a, a dear friend. This is at the end of his life where he is dying of AIDS. And this is just about the last self-portrait. And he's produced, as you can see, a classic, but extremely moving and tragic last look into the mirror, so to mm. speak, and last look into our eyes. I remember meeting him in the 70s um, at a party in Kensington and somebody said to me, I'd like you to meet this brilliant young photographer, Robert Maplethorpe, and he was wearing all black leather and that was just the starters. <laughs> um, anyhow, I think that Maplethorpe is one of the artists who is most asked for and uh, he has this special role of giving teenagers permission to behave the way they want to behave. I remember the first show we had, I think it was in Sheffield, mm -hmm. um, having uh, the people from the Maplethorpe Foundation come and meet the youth group. And I promise you, Nobody had blonde hair, nobody had dark hair, everybody's hair was purple or orange or... I mean, Maplethorpe allows you somehow to be the person you want to be when you're 15. It's a very... Do you, do you understand that? Does that sound like a real thing? It's extreme. Yes. Yes, yeah. and both young men and girls yeah. all felt empowered by him. Yeah, um, we showed this one because um, we've got a, a unique room of 20 self-portraits from him as a very young man through to the tragic end. Uh, these are um, two shots of... Um, the three rooms of uh, Roy Lichtenstein, which um, the artist's widow and the foundation have promised us um, as uh, an extraordinary gift to artist rooms. And they're on view now, the National Galleries of Scotland, and have been uh, during the festival, we had, I think, 180,000 visitors. This is our own <laughs> our own boy. He used to work in our gallery um, painting walls and helping us to install shows. And usually, we were falling over ourselves with laughter because he had such a great sense of humour <laughs> and he was very good at teasing everyone. Meanwhile, back at home, he was pickling sheep. <laughs> <laughs> I particularly wanted to try and get this sculpture, which is called Away from the Flock, because it's a poignant work, unlike anything else in the history of art. It has interesting relationship to Christian iconography. The very title, Away from the Flock. And then it relates to pre-Raphaelite painting. And it seems to me altogether an iconic thing. The first show that we did of Damien 
with artist rooms visited in 2009 at the Scottish National Gallery of Modern Art. And that is a country where you see a lot of sheep <laughs> as you go to the highlands or the lowlands. And I want people to be able to see something which was, first of all, like a shock to them, and then it's actually adorable and a beautiful sheep. You sort of fall in love with it. And then you have a dialogue. Was this killed by the artist? You know, does the artist have the right to do that? You have moral questions jumping up at you immediately. And I think that it's uh, the work behind it on the left is called Painkillers. That's a subject we all know about. And the work on the right, and we're looking at a show here in Leeds, where Damien was brought up, is called With Dead Head. And I think that is the youthful, laughing Damien with um, a dead head in the mortuary. And it's very touching to be able to show beautiful works of his. Um, I think that um, there are relatively few things, isn't this true, Francis, in museums in this country? And so to have a number of iconic works which can travel and tell the dame in her story <coughs> seems to me like a, a really useful thing to have. Who's that good looking guy? That's Ed. You want to tell <laughs> us about him? <laughs> Ed Ruscha, one of our great heroes. Um, I mean, Anthony's known Ed for much longer than I have, but I had the privilege of visiting Ed Ruscha with Anthony about, gosh, probably about eight years ago. The, the moment uh, he met Francis, he said, what do you want, what do you want? Do you want a gift? I, I, I want to give you a wonderful gift. I want to give you a masterpiece. You're so nice. You're That's so happy. Francis. True. We had dinner with He them. fell in love with Francis, <laughs> and then he said, you know, just tell me what you want. <laughs> we'll have a look at it in a moment. Okay, we had dinner with Ed in Los Angeles, and a very nice dinner, and we were visiting the studio the next day, and before we went to the studio, Anthony said, go on, ask him for something. Why don't you ask him for that painting? <laughs> and he'd seen the painting earlier in his, in his home. And so... And he was so nice and friendly and welcoming. So I said, Ed, I wonder whether you thought about maybe helping us build your artist room. And there's that wonderful painting upstairs. And he said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave us this amazing painting. Do we have a picture of it? The music from the balconies nearby was overlaid by the noise of sporadic acts of violence. Now, that's that pretty mean? good. You know, you're amazing. So that's a great painting. That's a four million dollar painting. So it's good to take this girl around with you. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, there's been a, a really nice legacy from from that time because Ed has. One of the things that Anthony hasn't said is that artists have. They're not just generous because they want their work to be seen, but they're generous because they really love Anthony and they really love this idea of artist rooms and above all. They've had the ones that have come to the UK and visited the regions and those galleries have had extraordinarily intimate and really very special experiences with some of those young people. Absolutely. And Ed is somebody who has come and he has been to Walsall and he met some of the young people there. And following that experience, I think he was so moved that he offered to give Tate uh, one proof of every single print edition he makes wow. to benefit artist rooms. So, you know, every and he makes a lot of prints. We <laughs> had no idea. <laughs> so we are inundated with these wonderful etchings and screen prints and photographs and artist books. And so we started off, I think, with two watercolors ten years ago in Tate, fifteen years ago, and now we have hundred and forty works, yeah. paintings, great, great, great drawings. Photographs, prints. By the best looking man in the art world. <laughs> <laughs> we, should, we should probably whiz on and. And those are, of course, young ambassadors. Yeah. I think the 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, I've got, I've got a question for you, but before I have a question... Oh, no. Oh, what is this? Oh, goodness. One of your favourites. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the German sculptor, Ron Muek, born in Melbourne, Australia, who came to this country about 20, 25 years ago. His mother is the painter Paula Rigo, and there was a show at the Hayward called Spellbound. She had one of her big, beautiful, funny paintings there, and she asked Ron, her son-in-law, Ron, be a darling boy and make me a little sculpture just to stand in front of it. And he made Pinocchio about that high, looking innocent, naked but for a pair of white fronts. And Charles Sarchi saw it and said, hey, this guy's a genius. <laughs> Bought three sculptures, which he showed in Sensation. And at the <coughs> time of Sensation, everybody said, but there's a new artist I've never heard of before. Yeah? His name's something like... Mook. <laughs> <laughs> and he's done a sculpture called Dead Dad, which became overnight and has remained one of the most famous sculptures of the 20th century. And it is a first that an artist makes a sculpture, his first work, apart from Pinocchio, becomes a sort of world famous work of art. And uh, we palled up with Ron, and um, ever since uh, um, we've been uh, involved in his life. And when we closed the gallery, we said to the, all, all the artists, now there are all these nice galleries in the world, you must go here, you must do that, you must go there. And we said to Ron, what are you going to do? And he said, oh, can't I stay with you? So we still look after him. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that's Manchester, and those are Manchester schoolgirls telling a particular story about this country, and also looking at quite a tough sculpture called Spooning Couple, which the artist took seven years to make. Whoops. There we are. Oh, and Gerhard Richter, we just ate at a wonderful show of his in Plymouth. And here we are in Kilmarnock, isn't it? And who are those children, Claire? It's a youth group that were working on the exhibition in Kilmarnock last year. And some of them are in trouble, aren't they? They're disadvantaged kids. And that tells you that if you look at a work of art long enough, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> and we put this in because one of the things we re what very much want to do is to do a Ruchenko room as one of the great artists, one of the great photographers of the 20th century. And, um, we own this beautiful work on the right and that photograph on the left. And we're working slowly to try and get there. Thank you. So, extraordinary um, story. Before um, I ask you a few final questions, can I just see if there are any questions or comments from our guests? Now's your chance. Be a wonder why. <laughs> Are there any plans for international tours mm. of artists from That's the question. Which well, comes up. I tell you something, a lot of people would like artist rooms mm -hmm. abroad. Um, so, watch this space. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's no shortage of, of um, <clears throat> institutions and places that would love to be part of the programme. I think the Hermitage always asks us. The Herm yeah, the Hermitage being the, the central museum of Russia. <laughs> there is a sort of, well, I mean, 
My feeling from this talk is that we need much more Anthony Dupes in this world. <laughs> I think we every country needs Anthony. Yes. Yeah. And Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe every country has got an Anthony. They just need to come out from... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that the problem normally with collectors is they want a big new building with yeah. their name in neon light mm -hmm. over the doorway and to be congratulated by very, very rich friends of theirs on their extraordinary taste. I think we sort of try to do the opposite. Mm -hmm. We don't do Absolutely. Yes. That you're doing the opposite. And that's quite rare still. One would have think, you know, that in the 21st century, people understand that they need to give. They have well, somebody to... has to have the idea. Anthony had this idea, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's such a compelling model that I cannot believe that it won't be emulated mm -hmm. in due course. It would be nice to see it in Omsk and Minsk. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other thoughts or comments? What was the most surprising element yeah. that came out of it? I think that um, the moment we started the shows, um, there was just a colossal demand from all over the country for something that everybody could share. And I think also you see from the shows that we've been, we've had slides, etc., that those exhibitions are equally good for, you know, 12 year olds or for art historians. So, they, everything was really aimed at the public and we tried very, very hard to make everything exciting and um, something that they could really engage with, everybody could engage with. I think it was an immediate success and then we were very, very lucky with the people, the curators and the staff of the Tate and the National Galleries of Scotland Everybody was immediately behind the whole thing. And so, you know, we felt an enormous support and help. Anthony, nobody has been more involved in this since we got together uh, than you. And you are 24 hours a day, folks in artist rooms, pushing it forward. And, we, you know, it has moved considerably on in depth and breadth since the launch of 2008. Um, for somebody who's totally committed to all aspects of it, what is the, if you could identify one single thing that drives you forward, what is it? Um, I, uh, whenever I'm with youth groups, I always say, who can tell me the name of the river that runs through this instrument. And then they all look at each other, is he potty? What does he mean? The river? What's he, what's he talking about? And why is that of interest? What I mean is this. There's a thing which goes through this, which is called the World Wide Web. Who invented the World Wide Web? Who can tell me who invented the river that goes through this? Somebody called Tim Berners-Lee himself invented that. Is that not correct? And he was knighted for it. So he invented what flows through this who did that logo of the apple and who designed every aspect of this instrument? Who knows that? Johnny Ive. 
What do Tim Berners-Lee and Johnny Ive have in common? They're both British. They're both British. <laughs> Something else they both have in common. What were they interested in as children? Not only sounds, but art. I think, in terms of creativity, art is a sort of really, totally crucial thing to look at, ponder over, and be strengthened by. And we all need strengthening. And did you see those girls who had looked at Louise Bourgeois and how they'd been inspired to think in new ways? I think that's the thing that we have to think about. I personally think, you know, we're on, we're heading for a precipice in 10, 15, 20 years' time if we don't address certain issues. Global warming, overpopulation, all sorts of problems. How are we going to solve those problems? We need bright young people to solve those problems. Where are they going to come from? I believe they're going to come from people who think in a new creative way. And that, again, is why art is so important. You know, the people we've look at, been looking at on that screen, they're geniuses. They're not geniuses in science or in mathematics, but they're geniuses in art and ideas. And we need to be able to think like that. And that's why I think artist rooms are crucial. Anthony, that was just extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much.